Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday, February 2nd, 2012 meeting of the Cape Cod Commission at the First District Courthouse Chamber of Assembly of Delegates, Barnstable, Mass. It is about 3.05 p.m. I would ask the secretary to call the roll. Barnstable Royden Richardson. Present. Born Michael Blanton. Present. Brewster Elizabeth Taylor. Present. Chatham Lynn Pleffner. Dennis Richard Roy. Present. East Ham Joy Brookshire. Yeah. Falmouth is vacant. Harwich Robert Bradley. Yeah. Mashby Ernest Virgilio. Present. Orleans Leonard Short. Here. Provincetown Austin Knight. Present. Sandwich Joanne O'Keefe. Truro Peter Graham. Wellfleet Roger Putnam, Here. Yarmouth John McCormick Jr., Here. County Commissioner Mary Pat Flynn, Minority Representative John Harris, Native American Representative Mark Harding, Governor's Appointee Herb Olson. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. At this time, would those people standing please find seats? Are there seats available? If there are seats available, please, uh, if there's one next to you, raise your hand so we can, everybody can be seated. Thank you. At this point, prior to public comment, I would ask anybody who has a cell phone or pager to please turn that off so we don't and we can minimize any kind of disruptions to the meeting. I also want to underscore the need for decorum today, which means uh, no personal attacks on people or institutions or any of that. So uh, it will be enforced. At this time, it's time for public comment. Anybody who has something that they would like to speak about that is not an agenda item, please come to the podium. Seeing none, I would ask the executive director for his report, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, seeing the number of people that are here today, the, I'm going to pass on the report. And I just want to uh, echo the chairman's comments about uh, the issue of the matter before us today. Certainly not the first time that the Cape Cod Commission has taken up an issue that's been uh, controversial, polarized, emotional on many levels. So the need for the, the tone to remain respectful to one another is certainly important. Um, and I do want to remind commission members that uh, the nature of this uh, DRI may require more than one meeting so that the issue of quorum is really important. Uh, going forward, uh, not only for this meeting, but for the next meeting and perhaps the meeting after that. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item four, the public hearing on new generation wind. I would have the secretary read the hearing notice, please. Hearing for the Cape Cod Commission, continued hearing from January 5th, 2012. Date Thursday, February 2nd, 2012, time 3 o'clock p.m. Place First District Courthouse, Assembly of Delegates, Chamber Route 6A, Barnstable, Mass. Project New Generation Wind. Applicant New Generation Wind Joint Venture. Project location West of Cape Cod Canal in Bourne, Massachusetts, adjacent to Borndale Road, Route 25, and Scenic Highway, Route 6, including the site of Cape Cod aggregates located at 665 Scenic Highway, Route 6. Project description, a wind energy generation project consisting of four turbines on multiple parcels in the town of Bourne, expected to generate approximately 9.5 megawatts of power. This project will be considered for a development of regional impact, DRI. The purpose of the final hearing is to allow for testimony on the proposed development and consideration of the proposed draft written decision and final DRI decision on the project by the commission. Anyone wishing to testify orally will be welcome to do so. Written comments may also be submitted at the hearing or delivered or mailed to the Cape Cod Commission, PO Box 226, 
32225 Main Street, Barnstable, Mass. The application plans and relevant documents may be viewed at the Cape Cod Commission office between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. For further information and to schedule an appointment, please contact the Cape Cod Commission at 508-362-3828. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Roger. Uh, council informs me that the uh, statements made by Attorney Pilots, uh, Tillotson uh, are without merit. The law is clear that anyone can hold an opinion based on fact, whether this view is commonly held or not. Given the fact that I support the staff report, but have no wish to taint the action of the commission, I will recuse myself. And lest anyone think that I'm leaving here because of the size of the mob, I'm going back to Wellfleet to rest up for a public hearing on Cumbie's hearing before the ZBA tonight. Thank you. At this point, we have several uh, groups of minutes needing uh, approval. And I will proceed with the motions, and then ask for a second, and then for approval. Uh, I move that the minutes for the public hearing of May 17th, 2011 be approved as written. I need a second from a sub Moved and seconded. Discussion? Amendments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. I move that... Just, uh, council has informed me to make sure that uh, it's just the members of the subcommittee that need to vote on this. Uh, the minutes of June 16th, public hearing 2011, I move to approve those minutes as written. I need a second. Any uh, uh, discussion, amendments, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. October 13th subcommittee meeting. I move to approve the minutes of that subcommittee meeting as written. Need a second? Moved and seconded. Discussion or amendments? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. October 20th, 2011 subcommittee meeting. I move to approve those minutes as written. Need a second? Moved and seconded. Any discussion or amendments? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. October 27th, 2011, subcommittee meeting. I move to approve those minutes as written. I need a second. second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion or amendments? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. I move the minutes on November 2nd, 2011 subcommittee meeting. Um, need a second. second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion or amendments? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. The purpose of today's hearing is to accept written and oral comment on the new generation wind project and to consider the subcommittee's draft written decision recommending denial of the project. At this time, I would have all those that wish to address the commission today please stand and be sworn in. Raise your right hand. I repeat your name. I swear that the testimony I'm about to give <laughs> is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. At this line, at this time, I will outline the process and uh, 
cover some additional information for today's hearing. Uh, wish to note there's a sign-in sheet near the back door at the table if people wish to provide comment. Please, people may also provide written comments. They may be sent to Elizabeth Enos at eenos at capecodcommission.org. Please keep comments limited to the proposed development that is before the Commission. After Cape Cod Commission staff and the applicant present, the Commission will hear first from all interested federal, state, and local officials. Due to the number of people wishing to speak on the proposed development, public testimony will be limited to two minutes. I will divide the time by the number of people who have signed in and wish to speak. If you are represented by counsel and wish to designate counsel, to utilize your time, please identify this on the sign-in sheet. All commission members have received a packet from the applicant of its pre for uh, its presentation. This information will be considered by the commission, even in light of our 14-day rule. As you know, it is with in the Commission's discretion to decide whether to accept information that was not timely filed. In the interest of allowing everyone an opportunity to be heard, I would suggest at the conclusion of today's hearings that we close the hearing but leave the record open for a period of seven days to allow everyone an opportunity to respond in writing to information in the record. This would make the deadline for written comments by Thursday, February 9th, 2012 at 4.30 p.m. Although people may comment on anything, the point of keeping the hearing open for written comments really is to allow for comments on new material. And the commission would urge you to limit your comments to the new information. All information received is posted on the Cape Cod Commission website at www.capecodcommission.org. Once on the website, look under Departments, Regulatory, then New Generation Win. This is updated on a daily basis. At this time, I would invite Christy Senatori to present the subcommittee draft decision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, members of the Commission. Christy Senatori, Chief Regulatory Officer for the Cape Cod Commission, presenting on the New Generation Wind uh, Subcommittee's draft decision. Thanks. Um, just to give you an overview of what I will be presenting this afternoon, I'll first walk the Commission through the procedural history for the project, a project description, the Cape Cod Commission's jurisdiction, the subcommittee findings, and the subcommittee's recommendation. To begin with the procedural history, um, the Commission received a DRI referral for the New Generation Wind Project on July 10, 2010 from the Bourne Planning Board. The proposal consisted of the construction of seven wind turbines expected to generate approximately 17 megawatts of power on 403 and a half acres in the town of Bourne, located west of the Cape Cod Canal. This application was withdrawn by the applicant on March 1st of 2011, and the withdrawal was accepted by the commission on March 3rd of 2011. On March 14th of 2011, the Cape Cod Commission received a Development of Regional Impact, or DRI, referral from the Bourne Planning Board and a DRI application from New Generation Wind for the same project that was previously withdrawn in March of 2011. The DRI application was deemed substantively complete on April 27, 2011, and the DRI hearing period was opened by hearing officer on May 12, 2011. The first substantive public hearing on the resubmittal of the DRI application was held on May 17, 2011. 
There were four substantive public hearings on the DRI application. These were held on May 17th, June 16th, July 20th, and August 1st of 2011. The subcommittee then held seven public meetings to deliberate on the project between August and November of 2011. And these are listed here, the dates of those meetings. At the meeting on October 27th, 2011, the subcommittee voted to recommend denial of the project to the commission. And at the meeting on November 2nd, 2011, the subcommittee voted to forward the draft written decision that's before you today to the full Cape Cod Commission. An extension agreement has been executed by the commission and the applicant, extending the decision period on the project through March 31st of 2012. I'll now go into the project description. Uh, first, the original project proposal, the project as originally submitted and referred as part of this DRI on March 14th of 2011, consisted of six two and a half megawatt wind turbines and one two megawatt wind turbine each with a height of 492 feet as measured to the tip of the blade at its highest point for a total output of 17 megawatts. Three of the seven turbines were proposed to have been located within the portion of the site currently occupied by Cape Cod Aggregate's sand and gravel mining operation. The other four turbines were located, uh, proposed in undeveloped woodland areas. On June 2nd of 2011, the applicant eliminated two turbines from the proposal. These were turbines three and six. And on July 6th of 2011, the applicant relocated two turbines, turbines two and four. Uh, and on, on July 13th, 2011, the applicant eliminated turbine number four from the proposal. So the proposal that is currently before the Cape Cod Commission today consists of three two and a half megawatt wind turbines. These are turbines one, two, and five, and one two megawatt wind turbine, which is turbine seven, for a total output of nine and a half megawatts. All of the turbines currently proposed are to be located in undeveloped woodland areas. And so this next slide gives you uh, an idea of what the property looks like. The property is outlined in yellow, and turbines, uh, turbine one shown here, turbine two, turbine five, and then turbine seven, which is located west of Route 25. To review with you the Cape Cod Commission's jurisdiction, the proposed development was referred to the Commission by the Town of Bourne and qualifies as a development of regional impact as a proposed commercial outdoor development with a total project area greater than 40,000 square feet. I'll now walk you through some of the subcommittee's findings that are outlined in the draft decision that's before you. First, beginning with the approval or denial criteria. In accordance with the Cape Cod Commission Act, after four public hearings on the project, the subcommittee considered whether the proposed development is consistent with the regional policy plan and the local comprehensive plan of the municipality in which the proposed development is to be located, the proposed whether the proposed development is consistent with municipal development bylaws, or if it's inconsistent, whether the inconsistency is necessary to enable a substantial segment of the population to secure adequate opportunities for housing, conservation, environmental protection, education, recreation, or balanced economic growth, whether the, if the proposed development is located in whole or in part within a designated district of critical planning concern, or DCPC, whether it's consistent with the regulations that were approved or adopted by the commission pursuant to section 11 of the Cape Cod Commission Act, and finally, whether the probable benefit from the proposed development is greater than the probable detriment. Um, I'll walk you through the subcommittee's findings in the regional policy plan issue areas. I would note that there are almost 20 pages in the decision of findings on the regional policy plan issue areas that are listed here on the screen. I will highlight the key findings and recommendations uh, made by the subcommittee for you. The first area beginning uh, is natural resources and open space. Uh, the property is a, is a significant natural resources area, and as such, the open space requirement is twice the total cleared area, or 23 acres. The applicant has an open space proposal before the commission consisting of two parcels, both, which are, both of which are located in the significant natural resources area. These two parcels total 20.46 acres. The subcommittee is recommending that the project meets best development practice, or BDP, OS 1.1 by providing high quality, naturally vegetated open space contiguous to existing, permanently protected open space, 
and therefore the open space requirement can be reduced by 20 percent, uh, which would make the requirement 18.4 acres. Based on this, the subcommittee is recommending that the commission find the proposed development meets minimum performance standard OS 1.3. In the issue area of economic development, minimum performance standard EB 4.1 requires that development of infrastructure and or capital facilities shall be in response to existing regional demand and shall improve the availability, reliability, quality, and cost of services. The subcommittee is recommending that the commission find the proposed development does not comply with minimum performance standard EB 4.1. Specifically, the subcommittee found that insufficient information was presented to find that the project's energy generation capacity is in response to existing demand for energy in the lower southeastern Massachusetts region, that insufficient information was presented to demonstrate that the project would improve the availability of energy on Cape Cod, that the applicant did not document ongoing problems with energy reliability in the region, um, or how, if such problems exist, this project would improve them, that the applicant did not submit persuasive evidence to demonstrate how the proposed project would improve quality of services in the region. And although the applicant provided information about pricing impacts on the spot market, the subcommittee found that the applicant did not demonstrate how the project would improve the cost of services in the region. Moving on to the issue area of water resources, which also includes hazardous materials and waste. According to the Regional Policy Plan Water Resources Classification Map 1, the entire project site is situated in the potential public water supply area, and the area where proposed Turbine 7 should, is to be located is an existing Zone 2 wellhead protection area. Upon request by the applicant at the September 8, 2010 Buzzards Bay Water District meeting, the board discussed the possibility of releasing this area from its potential public water supply area designation. In written correspondence dated September 13, 2010, Barry Woods, the superintendent of the Buzzards Bay Water District, wrote, quote, after consideration and due diligence, the board unanimously voted to indefinitely postpone any action on the proposed request for undesignation of the Cape Cod Commission potential public water supply area. The board, in its wisdom and by authority of its responsibilities, chose to stand as the environmental stewards of the district and in support of the commission's potential public water supply area for existing and future potential sites and sources. As commissioners of the public water system, this is the action they have chosen to take in reference to the undesignation request, end quote. The subcommittee found that the town of Bourne's decision to maintain this potential public water supply area designation and their refusal to lift such designation indicates the desire to maintain the area as an area located uh, as an area from which the residents of the town of Bourne could potentially draw their drinking water. Based on this potential public water supply area and wellhead protection area designations, there are minimum performance standards in the regional policy plan that limit the amount of hazardous materials and wastes that may be used, treated, generated, handled, stored, or disposed of to a household quantity. However, the regional policy plan also has standards that allow the household quantity limit to be exceeded through offsets pursuant to standards WM12 and WM1.3. Uh, I'll discuss turbines 1, 2, and 5 together as they are in the same potential public water supply area. The subcommittee found that the three turbines will use 1,470 gallons of petroleum-based lubricants, greases, and coolants, and will generate 134 gallons of waste gear oil and waste coolant. The turbines are also proposing to use a vegetable oil-based transformer fluid. Application materials identify the substance as EnviroTemp FR3 fluid, which is composed of approximately 98.5% vegetable oil and 1% additives, mainly antioxidants and color. The subcommittee is recommending that the entire amount of the vegetable oil-based transformer fluid should be considered a hazardous material. The total amount of the vegetable oil-based transformer fluid proposed for turbines 1, 2, and 5 is 1,599 gallons. Turbine 7 is situated in the wellhead protection area. It's proposing 475 gallons of petroleum-based lubricants, greases, and coolants, 134 gallons waste gear oil and waste coolant, and 533 gallons of vegetable oil-based transformer fluid, all of which the subcommittee has deemed as hazardous. 
As I mentioned previously, the regional policy plan allows the household quantity amount to be exceeded, provided the applicant offsets the amount of hazardous materials and waste. Minimum performance standard WR13, uh, excuse me, WM13, provides that development and redevelopment within wellhead protection areas that involves the use, treatment, handling, storage, or disposal of hazardous materials or hazardous waste may be allowed to exceed the quantity limits <coughs> of hazardous materials in WM 1.1 up to, but not exceeding the amount that the development or redevelopment permanently eliminates at another facility, project, or site within the same wellhead protection area, and provided adequate documentation of the volume eliminated is approved by the Cape Cod Commission. Uh, again, I can address turbines 1, 2, and 5 together, as they are in the same potential public water supply area. As part of the propo proponent's offset proposal, the applicant has um, proposed to remove one uninstalled 4,000 gallon above ground storage tank from the Cape Cod aggregates portion of the property. The applicant filed its original DRI application for this development on July 2nd, 2010, and Cape Cod aggregates requested an installation permit for this empty above ground tank from the state fire marshal on September 7th of 2010. The subcommittee is recommending that no permits for this tank existed at the time of the original DRI, nor was this tank in use at the Cape Cod aggregate site. The applicant has also proposed to not install an additional 4,000 gallon tank from, also from the Cape Cod aggregates portion of the site. Again, the applicant filed its original DRI application for this development on July 2nd of 2010, and Cape Cod aggregates requested an installation permit from the state fire marshal on October 6th of 2010. The subcommittee is recommending that no permits for this tank existed at the time of the original DRI, nor was this tank in use at the Cape Cod aggregate site. In the materials that you have before you now that have been submitted by the applicant, you will see that after the subcommittee made its recommendation to the full Cape Cod Commission, but, but before the hearing that's uh, being held today, the applicant installed one of the 4,000 gallon tanks on the Cape Cod aggregate site. This 4,000 gallon diesel fuel tank is no longer being offered as an offset. The subcommittee recommends that the commission find that the tanks that are being proposed as an offset are not being eliminated and that an applicant cannot introduce hazardous materials onto a site for purposes of receiving a credit for its offset. The subcommittee further found that there is no written deed restriction in the record or other mechanism which would guarantee in perpetuity that the same hazardous material would not be reintroduced into the site at a later date. Based on this, the subcommittee is recommending that the applicant's offset proposal for turbines 1, 2, and 5 does not comply with minimum performance standard WM 1.3. For offsets for Turbine 7, the applicant has not pr proposed any offsets for Turbine 7. In a letter dated August 9, 2011, Attorney Diane Tillotson, on behalf of the applicant, states, quote, Mr. Ingersoll, on behalf of the project, has contacted a number of potential users of oil in the Zone 2 Wellhead Protection District in which the proposed Turbine 7 is to be located. As a result of these conversations, at least one person has expressed a willingness to allow the new generation wind project to replace a qualifying oil tank in order to meet the minimum performance standards. This individual, however, does not wish his name to be released and made part of the public record unless and until new generation wind has received approvals from the commission and the town." End quote. The applicant acknowledged at the October 27, 2011 subcommittee meeting that the commission did not have enough information to make a determination on their proposed offsets compliance with the minimum performance standards. The applicant also expressed no intent to come forward with any additional information at the commission's public hearing to show fulfillment of the commission's offset requirements. Therefore, the subcommittee is recommending that the commission find there is not enough information to determine whether the applicant's proposed offset is to be permanently eliminated at another facility, project, or site, whether it was proposed to be removed from the same wellhead protection area, nor whether there is adequate documentation of the volume eliminated. As such, the subcommittee is recommending that the commission find the unidentified offset does not comply with minimum performance standard WM 1.3 for turbine 7. Moving on to the issue area of her heritage preservation and community character, uh, Borndale Village includes a small collection of historic structures and landscapes uh, related to early development around the Herring Run and is eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places and also includes scenic roadways. 
Based on this, the subcommittee found that the Borndale Village meets the regional policy plan definitions of a cultural landscape and a scenic area. The Cape Cod Canal is also eligible for listing on the National Reg Register of Historic Places for its role in the maritime history of the region, for its three historic bridges, and its engineering significance. Based on this, the subcommittee found that the Cape Cod Canal, including the scenic pullouts, the Herring Run Recreation Area, and the Midway Recreation Area, and the two bridges, is a cultural landscape and a scenic area. Visual simulations were prepared by the applicant which demonstrated the views of the turbines from these cultural landscapes and scenic areas. Based on the photo simulations that were provided by the applicant, the subcommittee found that proposed turbines 1, 2, and 7 will be visible from limited areas in Borndale Village and they will not be visually prominent in views from this landscape. Turbines 1, 2, and 7 will be visible from parts of the Cape Cod Canal, particularly areas at high elevation. These turbines will not be visually prominent from the canal recreation area because the only, only the upper portions of the turbines will be visible above the trees. And their prominence when viewed from the bridges will be limited by their distance and by the bridge railing structure. Proposed turbine five is located closer to the Cape Cod Canal than the other turbines and will be visible from the portions of the Cape Cod Canal, including the public recreation areas and the bridges. The subcommittee is recommending that the locations of the turbines will retain the distinctive qualities of these cultural landscapes and maintain their general scale and character defining features in compliance with minimum performance standard HPCC 1.2. And further, that the turbines will not present adverse visual impacts to scenic areas consistent with minimum performance standard HPCC 2.3. Uh, and lastly, an archaeological survey and report of the site was conducted by Plymouth Archaeological Rediscovery Project, stating that no significant historic or archaeological resources were identified within the project area. Uh, the proposed project was also reviewed by the Massachusetts Historical Commission and was determined not to impact archaeological resources, resource areas. And for those reasons, the subcommittee is recommending that the proposed project complies with minimum performance standard HPCC 1.3. That concludes the piece of the regional policy plan. Uh, one of the additional DRI approval criteria is consistency with the local comprehensive plan. Uh, written testimony dated July 28, 2011, provided by Corinne Moore, town planner for the town of Bourne, states, quote, the current new generation wind project will be reviewed under the pre-May 9, 2011 special town meeting wind turbine bylaw and therefore would be considered consistent with the local comprehensive plan which calls for the town to adopt bylaws and guidelines that promote alternative energy, specifically wind turbines, end quote. The subcommittee recommends that the commission adopt the testimony of Corinne Moore and find that the proposed development is consistent with Bourne's local comprehensive plan. Uh, another DRI approval criteria is consistency with local development bylaws. The subcommittee is recommending that the commission adopt the July 28, 2011 written testimony of Corinne Moore, again, Bourne Town Planner, and find that the proposed development as it relates to turbines one, two, and five is consistent with municipal development bylaws, provided the project be required to fulfill a condition requiring the applicant to seek and obtain a special permit from the town of Bourne for turbines one, two, and five in order to comply with local development bylaws. Uh, continuing on with consistency with local development bylaws for turbine seven, the subcommittee is recommending that Turbine 7 is not a neighborhood wind energy system as it is not owned by and will not serve the energy needs of a group of 10 or more residential customers that reside in a single neighborhood. Based on this, the subcommittee is recommending that the commission find that Turbine 7 is inconsistent with municipal development bylaws for Turbine 7. Uh, an additional approval criteria is consistency with applicable districts of critical planning concern or DCPCs. The proposed project is situated within the Borndale District of Critical Planning Concern. A written testimony dated July 28, 2011, again from Corinne Moore, states, quote, that the DCPC nomination was made to include protection of the following resources, water resource district, wildlife, natural, scientific, or ecological resource district, cultural, historic, architectural, or archeological resource district, economic or development resource district, transportation management district. End quote. Ms. Moore further stated that the new generation wind project is consistent with the DCPC. 
As such, the subcommittee recommends that the commission adopt the testimony of Corinne Moore and find that the development is consistent with the regulations approved or adopted by the commission pursuant to section 11 of the Cape Cod Commission Act for the Borndale District of Critical Planning Concern. The last DRI approval criteria is uh, the probable benefits versus the probable detriments of the project. Here the subcommittee has found uh, this list of project probable benefits. Um, the subcommittee has found that the project um, probable benefits include that the project help meets the state mandate for renewable energy, the tax, tax benefits to the municipality, that the project could be an economic stimulator, the green energy rebate program being offered by the project's proponents, the long-term evaluation and validation, uh, validation of fitness of purpose that the project would provide, the contribution to lessening dependence on fossil fuels, the contribution to renewable energy, the permanent protection of approximately 20 acres of open space in a significant natural resources area as further defined investment, best development practice OS 1.10, and additionally the contribution this project would provide to the grid. The subcommittee also found that the project's probable detriments include a probable negative effects on Bourne's water supply, probable diminishment of property values, probable negative impacts on the local Native American tribe, the proximity of the proposed project to the nearby elementary school, the possibility that this project would, uh, could detract from tourism, that the proposed project would dilute efforts to pursue alternate sources of renewable energy, the probable health effects of the project, the effect of the project on community morale, and finally, the probable negative effect on wildlife, including birds and bats. And so in conclusion, the subcommittee recommends that the commission find the probable benefit from the proposed development is not greater than the probable detriment. And lastly, the subcommittee is recommending that the Cape Cod Commission deny without prejudice the development of regional impact application for the new generation wind project. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would ask the applicant for their presentation on the proposed development, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Graham, members of the commission, uh, Mr. Nidzwicki, uh, staff, uh, members of the public. Uh, my name is Diane Tillotson. I'm an attorney uh, representing New Generation Wind, LLC. Uh, this afternoon, we are going to present our uh, project, uh, or there will be three presenters of our project, um, Carlos Pineda from Clear Planet Energy, who has presented in the past, myself, and then David Peterson. Uh, before we begin, however, I would like to introduce uh, the members of our team. Uh, first, I'd like to start with the owners of the project, uh, represented by Dave Peterson from Cape Cod Aggregates. Um, Jerry and Phyllis Ingersoll from the Ingersoll Family Trust, uh, both local Cape Cod owners. Carlos Pineda from Clear Planet Energy, our energy consultant. John Lippman, our uh, project um, permitting consultant. Um, and Atla uh, Rich Tabazinski from uh, Atlantic Design Engineers, our project uh, engineers. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to introduce briefly the location of the project site. Uh, I know that that's been covered by the commission staff, but to give you some perspective, it's the area that's circled in blue. Uh, the project site is largely located uh, between Routes 25 and Route 6 uh, on the uh, on the landward side of the Cape Cod Canal in the town of Bourne. It consists of approximately, uh, approximately 240 acres and 133 of those acres are within the existing sand and gravel pit operated by Cape Cod Aggregates, which you can see on uh, this slide. <clears throat> We are here today to make an unusual request of you as the commission body. And that request is that you not adopt the recommended decision of the subcommittee uh, dated November 10th, 2011. To the best of our knowledge, uh, the commission has never voted in favor of a project with a negative recommendation from the subcommittee. Nevertheless, we are asking you to do this today because 
the evidence in the record, we would suggest, overwhelmingly substantiates the project's benefits. We would also suggest that federal, state, and regional policy, state law, and the goals and performance standards of your very own regional policy plan require you to approve this project. And finally, we urge you to do this because it is the right thing to do for Cape Cod. I'm going to have a little bit more to say about the specifics of the findings that were made in the subcommittee's report, but I'd like to turn the microphone over to Carlos Pineda at this time. Thank you, Diane. Uh, thank you, Chairman Graham, members of the committee, esteemed public. My name is Carlos Pineda. I'm with Clear Planet Energy, and I'm a development consultant for the project. I'm going to provide a brief overview of new generation wind and a summary of its benefits. Next slide. The project, as has been well described, is a four turbine project, 9.5 megawatts of power production. That's enough to power 3,000 homes. It was reduced from a seven turbine project over the course of uh, permitting with the Cape Cod Commission. We listened to concerns uh, and uh, con an analysis from the commission as well as the public, and we were responsive to those concerns and reduced the scope of our project. Uh, the project owners are long-standing community members and businesses. They're committed to renewable energy on their property. We have an experienced local team that has done this before and has uh, done a great job with the development of this project. And really, we have a project that is about renewable energy leadership. Cape Cod's a coastal zone that will be heavily impacted by sea level rise and climate change, and we feel that new generation wind is part of the solution. This is the site plan. Uh, before I get into the uh, details of the site plan, I'd just like to take a step back and, and just review the project again. This is a project where the landowners themselves are the sponsors. They are proposing a private project on private property. We've been responsive to public comment over the course of, uh, of, of, the, of the permitting process. We've appreciated working with the commission. We feel we've been scrupulously uh, responsive to public comment and to the issues raised. Our project meets all laws and we feel that it, it, we, we demonstrate that we meet all minimum performance standards of the Commission. Not only have, been, have we been responsive at this level, we, we have, were responsive to the uh, regional policy plan of the Commission itself, which asks for more renewable energy to be developed, and to the renewable portfolio standard of the state of Massachusetts, which legally mandates that renewable energy be developed in the state. And our, the sponsors, the landowners, the community members here in front of you invested on this basis. So with this, with this, uh, um, this site layout, just a couple things because time is short. You see the four turbine locations. You see the location of the gravel pit. I want to highlight a couple things. Uh, the concentric circles around the turbines are distances at 1,000, 1,500 and 2,000 feet. Uh, those uh, form the eligibility criteria for our green rebate plan. To my knowledge, I've been involved in dozens of projects. I've, n I've never known a project to develop a, a program like this, which gives back the uh, value of fixed price renewable energy to neighbors. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great program. We also see the high voltage lines coming out uh, in, of, the, of the gravel pit and continuing across the canal. These are 345 kV and 115 kV trunk line, transmission lines. This is the right place to put an energy project. It's responsive to the grid, it's responsibility to reliability concerns, and it's a great place to interconnect. Moreover, we're, we're doing it on an existing business and we're doing it where there is undeveloped woodlands. And wind projects, as you know, are an excellent way to help maintain open space. This is a well-sided project. Like next slide. A bit about the benefits. Um, this team and 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 the and these these sponsors designed a project not only that you know is a is a private project that needs to function privately, but that has maximum public benefit. We considered other alternatives and and did not go forward because we didn't think they had the right mix of public and private benefit. 
local ownership, local development, permanently protected open space, $120,000 a year or $3 million over 25 years in property taxes, uh, lots of construction uh, related employment, over $20 million invested into the regional economy. And I want to say a couple notes on the availability ED 4.1 minimum performance standard. Uh, and the availability, reliability, and quality of cost of services. Uh, we think My Generation Energy, the solar project that was recently approved, is a great project. It should have been approved. We, we applaud you. On all of these qu criteria below, they're the same issues as our project, and we were denied on these, on, or we, we have a negative recommendation on those, on those. We actually do better. We produce 14 times the energy, have higher capacity factors, and are five times less expensive. Solar is five times the retail cost of wind. There's a lot of other uh, uh, benefits here, but for sake of time, I won't go into them. Next slide. Uh, in terms of environmentally, again, I'll just highlight a few. Uh, 614 gigawatt hours of energy over 25 years. This is equivalent to removing of wind energy over 25 years, equivalent to removing 14,000 Goodyear blimps of natural gas. Uh, over 500,000 cubic yards of radioactive tailings, over 400 million pounds of carbon dioxide. Next slide. And finally, uh, the wind turbine health impact study, which was recently released by the Department uh, of Environmental Protection, Department of Public Health, found that there were no direct health impacts uh, from wind turbines. Uh, after a broad review of scientific articles and citizen concerns and other available data. This is a Blue Ribbon independent panel that made these findings. They also made a few recommendations on, on issues like noise, shadow flicker, and ice throw. New Generation Wind complies with all of those recommendations. The panel recognized that advances in turbine technology have addressed many of the perceived issues around wind, uh, wind power. We use top tier new technology. It's pitch regulated. The blades feather in high wind regimes, stall regulated turbines, which there's been some problems I hear with turbines like that locally, produce a lot more noise. This is new technology and we're proud to bring it to the area. And finally, um, it recommended implementing uh, noise and shadow flicker control modules on, on the turbine technology. Uh, we have this technology, we will use it. We will also use it in combination with a noise and shadow flicker protocol that allows us to respond to any, any complaints and address them in a timely manner. We lay this all, this is, these are all things that I have not seen done on other projects. This project is going above and beyond when, when it comes to development. We appreciate your time, thank you. Hi, Diane Tillotson again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are trying very hard to stay within the time constraints that have been set by uh, the chair. And uh, although we will endeavor to do so, I would ask you all to recognize that this is a project that has been three and a half years in the making. And uh, trying to condense it to 25 minutes uh, is, is a bit of a challenge. I'd like to start, I want to cover three points only with you. Uh, we've submitted a vast amount of written material. And I would hope that you would have take the opportunity opportunity to review the written material, and I appreciate the chair's acceptance of materials uh, submitted yesterday. The first thing I'd just like to call your attention to and highlight is our, a chart that I put together called New Generation Wind Requested Revised Findings. I uh, felt that this would be a helpful tool for you as members of the commission in reviewing exactly what it is we're asking you to do. And for each of the findings that we're suggesting are in error, and we're suggesting that a number of your findings are in error, we have listed a, a summary, essentially, of what that finding is. We have put in the second column, that's in the column on the far uh, left-hand side of the document, we have put in the center column uh, our proposed requested finding, the finding that we're actually asking you to make, and the finding that we suggest that state law, the regional policy plan, and the eviden evidence in this record would require you to find. And then over in the right-hand column, we've actually listed a reference back 
to the evidence in the record or the particular portion of the regional policy plan that supports our request for this finding. And again, we feel that, the, that in order to be consistent with the regional policy plan, the Commission is essentially required by its charge to revise uh, some of its findings. Uh, I would, I know that the subcommittee worked hard uh, and it, it is not often that I would suggest that to a deliberative body that some of these findings were made in error. However, subsequent, uh, or, or however, uh, the, the law is uh, uh, clear and the regional policy plan requirements are clear. Moreover, the thing that I would also like to point out to all of you as commission members you uh, yourselves adopted findings recently in the My Generation Energy decision, which was December 15, 2011, that on the, same, uh, on the same facts are in diametric opposition to the findings you made on our project. And I would urge you that those findings were accurate findings and that you reconsider on that basis, among others, your findings for this project. Um, I'm going to cover just very quickly a couple of the uh, specific findings. The first is the finding on consistency with municipal bylaws. Uh, I know that today Corinne Moore submitted another letter into the record uh, that, and she is the town planner for the town of Bourne, again stating in, that in her view, Turbine 7 is a neighborhood wind energy turbine that complies with the local development, local zoning bylaws of the town of Bourne. She outlines the reasons for that in her letter. I would suggest to you that with respect to every other finding related to consistency with municipal bylaws, you adopted Corinne Moore's testimony, and that is in your record. I cannot understand, and it is perplexing, why, with respect to this one particular turbine, you determined to substitute essentially your own judgment for that of the town planner who deals with these bylaws day after day. I would also point out that in the My Generation Energy decision, which I referenced a moment ago, with respect to consistency with local bylaws, you found clearly and unequivocally uh, you adopted the, the consistency uh, with local bylaws and you made that determination based on the recommendation of the person who had the equivalent function in the town of Barnstable uh, that Corinne Moore does in the uh, town of Bourne. That's the first uh, quick um, uh, finding. The second finding I'd like to call your attention to is that with respect to Turbine 7. Uh, we did, and I, uh, it was re read into the record um, by uh, Ms. Senatori, uh, we did offer uh, to the uh, subcommittee uh, a condition uh, that we be required to provide the offset for that turbine. It is true that we were not, that the person that we were able to identify did not want to be identified in the public forum and on the public record until the permits were obtained. I would respectfully suggest to all of you that you would have to be living under a rock to recognize that this project is not controversial and that you, while we understand that our opposition is well-intentioned. Uh, we do feel that they have been intimidating in some circumstances. And for a person who is uh, ready, stands ready to provide us with an offset to ask that their name not be, be made part of the public record is entirely reasonable. I would suggest to you that the condition that we have suggested with respect to Turbine 7, which places the burden entirely on us to meet that offset, if we don't provide the offset, if we don't give you the evidence that you need that we've met that condition, that turbine will not move ahead, and we understand that. But we respectfully ask that you grant conditional approval to Turbine 7. I'd like to make just a very brief comment about the evidence that's in the record. 
when reviewing evidence, a quasi-judicial body such as yourself has to apply both a qualitative and a quantitative analysis to the evidence that you have before you. Simply because the pile of evidence that the opponents have presented may be slightly higher or weigh slightly more if you put it on a scale than what the applicant has uh, supplied you with, and I'm not even sure that's the case here. I know both. I know that both uh, opponents of the project and the applicants have uh, submitted uh, volumes and volumes and volumes of material in this case. But you have to weigh the evidence that comes in, uh, and this is what the function of a judge or a quasi-judicial body is. And I would respectfully suggest to you that the subcommittee failed to recognize many of the project benefits, which my colleague Dave Peterson is going to talk about, and many of the project detriments that were focused on were in fact not um, fully substantiated in the record. There's no evidence that this is going to have an impact on tourism. No, imp no evidence that it's going to have any negative impact on Native American, um, uh, Native American traditions or religious uh, observances. There's no evidence of so many things that were made as negative determinations. On the positive side, before I hand it over to Mr. Peterson, I would just like to highlight one thing referenced very briefly um, by Mr. Pineda because it was not even mentioned in the subcommittee decision, and we feel this is very important. And that is the new generation win complaint protocol, protocol excuse me, and mitigation plan. From day one of this project, this plan has been part of our record. And it is our commitment as local owners to be staying with this project long after it is constructed. This is not a situation where a developer comes in and then leaves after the project is constructed. And I just want to highlight a couple of aspects of that. But I would also note that the independent panel from the put together by the Department of Public Health and the Department of Environmental Protection, when it released its report, uh, two, approximately two weeks ago, finding no adverse health effects or not, not insufficient evidence of adverse health effects, recommended, among other things, that there be monitoring post-construction of these turbines so that we could provide more data. We did put this, we had this, uh, again, submitted from the very outset of our project. It requires five years of monitoring for sound and flicker. It sets up an escrow account to fund a complaint protocol. This is a developer that is committed to the citizens of Cape Cod, committed to this project, and committed to the overall goal of providing renewable energy on the Cape. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dave Peterson. Roughly five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. I, I, I appreciate the time constraint. Um, as my colleague, Diane, Ms. Tillotson, said, we've been working on this project for three and a half years. I, I, would, I would ask that you might indulge me a few more minutes than that, if you would. My name is Dave Peterson. I'm a member of the LaRusso family, owners of Cape Cod Aggregates and longstanding benefactors to Cape Cod and its many communities and towns. And partners here in the New, genera New Generation Wind Project, along with another longtime Cape family, the Ingersolls. We felt that it was important that I close the presentation today for a number of reasons, not the least of which is to bring an owner's perspective to this whole process and, and, and what we're concerned with. You see, as well as being an active participant in this project, I'm a native. The son of a fourth generation Cape Codder himself, who was the youngest of 15 children, making my children six generation natives of this very special place. And as a native Cape Codder, I have a real stake in protecting what I love, a stake in protecting this place I was born and raised, this place that my wife and I have decided to raise our children. As a business owner and a project developer that lives and works here in the community, and as someone who understands and respects the process, I'm deeply concerned that this permitting process has allowed for some stark inconsistencies and some inflexible findings that do not support the evidence and testimony that we painstakingly presented. My hope is that you too will be concerned about this 
and that you'll take action to remedy the deficiencies. So let me explain a few of my specific concerns. The Commission recently approved the My Generation Energy Project, and as we've stated, we think it's a great project. But with regard to economic development, and specifically ED 4.1, the Commission found that the MGE project meets the standard of MPS 4, ED 4.1 of improving availability, reliability, quality, and cost of service based upon their determined rationale. We outlined similar benefits in our presentations. Yet our findings seem to fail to acknowledge that our rationale met the standard. We improve availability of renewable energy here on the Cape that has the potential to benefit local businesses such as Cape Cod aggregates to meet our high demands for electricity for the facilities and plants that we run in Hyannis, Falmouth, Sandwich, and Bourne. We improve reliability not only in the upgrades to various distribution lines around the projects, but also, as we have demonstrated with hard numbers, our renewable energy project would have a positive impact on the high demand days in the peak summer months when the transmission lines are straining to pull power from distant sources and the bid prices are sky high. The MGE project was also found to improve quality by reducing consumption of traditional sources of energy generation by eliminating the requirements for natural gas, coal, crude, even uranium. But what is more interesting and more impressive is that while that project was deemed to be environmentally beneficial because of these reductions, our project reduces those same traditional sources of energy by over 10 times what the MGE project does. We cite reductions in nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide as examples of the many environmental benefits renewable energy reduces vital in the struggle to both eliminate the need for traditional fuel sources and reduce hazardous solid waste and atmospheric contamination. These positive results were deemed to be significant local, regional, and global benefits. Finally, cost. The MGE project found that since ownership of the project was local, as is ours, the renewable energy it creates will offset local electricity expenses as will ours, with one huge and glaring difference. Their project will only produce 7.5% of the energy that our project will generate, enabling us to supplement the energy needs of our neighbors through a green energy rebate program and provide the opportunity to enter into power purchase agreements with other local businesses and local end users thereby reducing the need for costly transmission of power to the Cape from distant locations. Another area of concern is hazardous materials. The Commission's decision in MGE found that the vegetable-based FR3 fluid used in the project transformers to be environmentally friendly and 98.5% non-hazardous. Yet the finding in our draft decision finds the exact same fluid to be 100% hazardous. How is that possible? We submitted reports from the EPA, DEP, the MSDS sheets from the manufacturer, all confirming that this food-based material has undergone extensive testing and has even won awards for ultimate biodegradability. Yet armed with all this information, the subcommittee still found this material to be 100% hazardous. We ask that you take up and reverse the findings on WRF 18 and 20 in the draft decision to reflect the same findings as the MGE project, that this product is 98.5% non-hazardous and as such only needs to be partially mitigated. But even with that potential correction, our project still needs to provide hazardous material offsets. As was detailed in our April 2011 DRI application, we propose to permanently eliminate 8,000 gallons of diesel and gasoline from another facility, the Cape Cod Aggregates Gravel Pit, within the same wellhead protection area. Let me explain. What you see here on the screen is a 4,000 gallon diesel tank that was previously offered as part of our hazardous materials mitigation and mentioned by Ms. Senatori. This particular tank was purchased and has been on site since 2009, and supporting documentation was provided to the staff. CCA obtained installation permits for both tanks 
prior to our April 2011 DRA, DRI application. But neither tank had been fully installed, so New Generation Wind offered both permits, a total of 8,000 gallons as, of ha as our hazardous materials offset, even though with regard to hazardous materials and the FR3 fluid, we felt that we only needed to offset 1,494 gallons of hazardous materials. This offer did, in fact, include permanent elimination and no additions to the hazardous materials inventory for the duration of the Cape Cod aggregates operation. The subcommittee and staff considered these installation permits and offsets to be theoretical in nature and denied their use as mitigation. These permitted tanks are part of the Cape Cod Aggregates gravel operation and not part of the NGW project, and as such, constitutes a completely different facility than the NGW project and therefore does comply with, M, with WM 1.3. In fact, there are no turbines located on the 126 acres that comprises the CCA gravel pit land. So herein lies the disconnect. Let's go back to the tank on the screen for a minute. The 4,000 gallon diesel tank purchased by and on site at the CCA facility since 2009, permitted for installation in September of 2010, and now, as of December 2011, this tank has been fully installed, inspected, permitted, and operational, and is no longer being offered as mitigation. The proposed mitigation offset now is the is the uh, installation of the remaining 4,000 gallon gasoline tank. A tank that will be installed and sit right next to this tank you see if this project is not permitted. We ask that you revisit the findings of w WRF 36 through 44 and apply flexibility in interpreting the performance standards of the regional policy plan in, two, in light of two very important articulated goals. One is the protection of groundwater, and two is the commitment to renewable energy. The installation permit for the gasoline tank represents a very real quantity of hazardous material to be permanently eliminated from another facility not under the control of new generation wind. The findings in the MG decision allowed for nearly $700,000 worth of hardship relief because that project could not provide the required open space. Instead of condemning the project and losing the clear community benefits, the decision was made to work and reflected the intent of the standard and the regional policy plan. We assert that this is a similar scenario and that flexibility in this case is not only appropriate, but in fact allows for greater protection to the potential water supply, a greater reduction of hazardous materials, and significantly greater community benefits in size and scope than the MGE project, in fact, some 13 times greater. As I near completion of our presentation, I'd like to leave you with a few relevant thoughts. Ms. Tillotson outlined several instances in which we felt the findings of the benefits detriments analysis were deficient. As she spent her time on some of the detriments, I'd like to briefly mention a few of the benefits that we think the subcommittee failed to recognize with regard to our project. Our project had the same economic and environmental benefits covered in the My Generation Solar Project, but as I mentioned, to a much greater extent. We, too, have the use of local residents, contractors, consultants to permit, design, manage, and construct this project. We have local ownership. We're creating a local generator of electricity. We're providing local energy to local businesses. We're creating a local green energy source. A lack of impervious services, a reduction in nitrogen loading, and enhancement of wildlife as a, resu as a result of reducing future development at the site. Listening and discussing these benefits is great. Many of them were recognized in the MGE project and not in ours. And these benefits are certainly significant, but I'd like to put it in a more appropriate context, and that of the regional policy plan and its stated goals. In the regional policy plan, the energy goal clearly states to promote a sustainable economic, natural, built, 
and social environment by reducing greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption through design and construction practices that increase energy conservation, promote energy efficiency, and promote self-sufficiency through the use of locally distributed renewable energy. The energy section of the RPP recognizes that the CAPE's long-term viability, its very sustainability, is tied to reducing our dependence on fossil fuels and more traditional sources of energy, energy production, because this dependence on fossil fuels has a variety of adverse environmental, economic, social impacts, and contributes to not only local, but worldwide greenhouse gas emissions and global climate change. Could I get you to uh, make a wrap in the next few minutes? You're, uh, you're I, 10 over at this point. So. I have just a few more minutes. Yes, Mr. Yes, Chairman. thank you. Furthermore, the uh, Regional Policy Plan recognizes that the use of the CAPE's abundant, clean, renewable energy resources represent an opportunity to reduce harmful emissions and provide a buffer against fluctuations in supplies and prices and to keep more money in the local economy. It even goes so far as to contemplate that emerging clean energy technologies will be a vital component of our regional economy. If we go to the next uh, distributed energy generation, the first line clearly states the towns should permit and encourage small-scale local power generation that primarily uses renewable energy sources to reduce the need to import power from off Cape. Let me end where I began. I am a native Cape Codder and proud of it. And this project is owned by multi-generational Cape Cod families, families fully invested in this community. And this, I believe, is one of the ultimate benefits and one that was not properly acknowledged or recognized. This project has clearly sparked debate from the local coffee shops to the political halls in Beacon Hill. But this body, is meant to operate above all that. It is our expectation that this body will follow its charge and put political and personal agendas aside and make findings and issue a decision that will honor the intent and purpose of the goals and standards of the Regional Policy Plan. If this body recognizes the clear stated goals of the Regional Policy Plan and utilizes all the tools at its disposal, then the ultimate finding can only be that we do meet the minimum performance standards. And the benefits of this project clearly outweigh the detriments because the benefits are real and the detriments are speculative. Your duty as members of this body is to fairly and impartially ap apply the requirements of the Regional Policy Plan to the facts and evidence presented for this project. We ask that you apply these facts fairly to us and that we be given the same opportunity to create a renewable energy source on the Cape, the same opportunity that, that was given to my generation energy. We are aware that we've raised many points concerning the application of the Regional Policy Plan and the minimum performance standards, both before this afternoon and since November 10th when this draft decision was voted upon. We respectfully ask you to consider reversing many of the specific findings that were made with respect to these minimum performance standards and suggest that you take whatever time is necessary to do so. We think it is important that each and every one of you completely understand the arguments and taking a vote on this matter, we urge you to take more time if you need it. Although the public hearing may be closed this afternoon, you are certainly able to take more time in deliberating your decision on this matter. And I and my dedicated colleagues on this team have worked on this, as I mentioned, for three and a half years. Your vote is far too important to us and to this community and to the future of renewable energy on Cape Cod to be rushed. We therefore would ask that you take whatever time you need. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, thank you for indulging me. Thank you. Is that the uh, completion of the applicant's presentation? At this point, I would ask if staff has a response. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, for the record, Christy Senatory, Chief Regulatory Officer. I just have a couple of points to make, just um, some clarifications for the Commission members. Uh, and this is in response to the applicant's materials and presentations. Um, the first, as it relates to the My Generation Energy Solar Project that, uh, as you recall, was approved by the Cape Cod Commission. Uh, this is a solar project in Barnstable. Um, as you've heard, the project involved the use of the same Envirotemp vegetable oil-based transformer fluid. Uh, the subcommittee and the full commission in that instance found that the 1.5% of the fluid, the additive, was considered hazardous. Here the subcommittee's recommendation to the full commission has deemed the entire amount hazardous. So just a point of clarification for the commission. Uh, as it relates to the probable benefits of the project, the applicant is suggesting that additional uh, potential probable benefits of the project um, are similar to those that have, were identified in the My Generation Solar Approval Decision. Those include providing a local green energy resource uh, and meeting several best development practices, including best development practice ED 3.2 local ownership. Staff is suggesting that the commission may want to consider whether uh, these should also be considered potential probable benefits of this project. Um, the applicant has suggested that a table that they have submitted illustrating a reduction in sources of greenhouse gas emissions from the project should be included in the probable benefits of the project. A similar list was included in the My Generation Energy uh, Solar Decision and, however, just as a point of clarification, this was evidence supporting the finding of compliance with minimum performance standard ED 4.1 and not in the benefits and detriments analysis. Um, uh, as it relates to economic development standard 4. ED 4.1, as you recall, this requires development of infrastructure or capital facilities to be in response to existing regional demand and shall improve the availability, reliability, quality, and cost of services. Again, with regard to the recent My Generation Energy Solar Decision, the Commission did find that the project met this standard as it is a net metered project that would improve the availability of renewable solar energy on Cape Cod. And they found, uh, you found this by, by finding that uh, it would directly serve existing Cape Cod businesses. It would improve reliability in two ways. As a solar energy, the plant's peak generation would exactly coincide with peak demand in the summer months on Cape Cod, and the plant would be located approximate to a feeder substation supplying power to the Cape's commercial hub in Hyannis, reducing the demand on the transmission system to pull power from more distant resources. The Commission <laughs> further found in that decision, uh, as it relates to quality, the list of environmental benefits of renewable energy and the reduction in sources of greenhouse gas emissions. The Commission also found that as a net metered project, it would directly offset the cost of energy for developers that would own the project. Uh, here, the applicant has submitted uh, information and evidence for the record as it relates to existing regional demand for renewable energy, uh, here wind energy, um, and how the project would Im uh, improve the availability, reliability, quality, and cost of services. So this is also something the Commission could could consider in its deliberations on consistency with minimum performance standard ED 4.1. Uh, and finally, just uh, to touch on the tank offset piece that um, you've heard about, again, minimum performance standard WM 1.3 allows the household quantity of hazardous materials limit to be exceeded, provided that the applicant permanently eliminates hazardous materials at another facility, project, or site within the same wellhead protection area and provided adequate documentation of the volume eliminated as approved by the Commission. You've heard that one of the 4,000-gallon tanks the, the applicant previously proposed not to install is no longer being proposed as an offset, and as part of the current proposal, the applicant is proposing to not install one 4,000-gallon tank. Uh, just a, a point of clarification, as Mr. Peterson indicated, that um, this 4,000-gallon tank would be installed on the portion of the property that is the 126-acre Cape Cod Aggregates facility. The entire DRI um, project site that has been submitted uh, as part of their application materials actually would include this um, portion of the site. They encompassed it as 403 acres, so just as a point of clarification for that. Um, and you've also heard and seen now in information in the record that the applicant has committed to delivering a restrictive covenant ensuring the permanent removal of the hazardous materials if the offset is accepted. Um, so that's all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would ask commission members seated 
for questions and questions to the applicant or questions for the staff. Uh, it would not be appropriate time to editorialize or maybe go off in a different direction about this, that, and the others. So uh, if you have specific questions for staff and the applicant, uh, now's the time. Elizabeth. I apologize that I had to take a break. Um, I don't know if the EnviroTemp issue was just discussed when I was out of the room. Is would you mind, um, Christy, I think, did you deal with that when you were, when I was taking a break? Did you I'm have a specific question? I'm sorry to ask question? you to repeat yourself, but um, did you deal with the whole EnviroTemp issue between my generation and this application? Yes. Or rather my generation and... Uh, so a specific question, Elizabeth, sure. about uh, that? Vegetable-based oil being okay, okay in one DRI and not in this sure. one. Sure, I'd be happy to address that. Um, okay. Uh, the My Generation Solar Project, the subcommittee, and the full Cape Cod Commission found that 1.5% of the fluid was considered a hazardous material. And here the subcommittee recommendation to you is that 100% of the fluid is considered hazardous. So my question is, how do we do that? It's total inconsistency between one DRI and another, and I, I don't know how I'm going to vote on this yet, but I know that when we make decisions, we need to retain a certain amount of consistency, and I'm sure this is going to be appealed no matter what our decision is, but we need to base our decisions on fact, and I'm really curious how we weighed in totally differently between one DRI and another. Mr. Zinswicki. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, uh, we have different people populating different subcommittees, applying the same minimum performance standards to uh, projects that may or may not be alike. It's not inconceivable that two different subcommittees could come to a different conclusion about one minimum, minimum performance standard. The MPS in question, though, the, the question is not whether the material is hazardous or not. Um, in both instances, they deemed that the, that the material that was proprietary, that we did not have information on, was hazardous. The only uh, discrepancy is that in one instance, they, uh, a subcommittee found that because one and a half percent of the total material was deemed hazardous, that all of the total volume was deemed hazardous. And in the other subcommittee, they found that uh, only that portion, that volume that was uh, unidentified was hazardous and should be offset. So it's just a matter of two different subcommittees uh, applying, uh, looking at the same fact pattern differently. And so I would just uh, advise the commission, uh, these subcommittee reports come uh, before you and uh, to the extent that there are inconsistencies or perceived inconsistencies, it's appropriate for the commission to consider those in inconsistencies. And so that's, that's why it's here. And, uh, your question is a valid one. Joy. Um, after reading all of the emails and reports and all, there seems to be some confusion about whether we denied this project entirely or we denied it without prejudice. And from what I've read, we've denied it without prejudice. Could you explain why? what denying without prejudice means and why the subcommittee chose those words and not denied. Council. Those, those words are used because uh, an applicant uh, always has the opportunity to uh, reapply their project at another time. So that's the purpose of those without prejudice. Any more questions for the applicant or staff? Yes, Mr. Richardson. I had, had a, I was on both of those subcommittees, and I had the same question in both ones, in terms of uh, that small percent of additive, whether indeed that was or was not, you know, uh, something that was uh, harmful. 
Uh, is that a question? This is not time to deliberate, but to ask questions of the applicant and or staff. All is right. that a I'm question? Trying, I'm, I'm trying to ask a question. Oh, very good. I'm sorry. The, <clears throat> so when, when information on a particular subject is not known, do we make the... Do we make the decision whether it's harmful or whether it isn't? That was, that was always my question. Mr. Neswicki. Yeah. Just, just to clarify, because it's an important point, the decision about whether the material that we don't know about is hazardous was made the same way in both cases. It was both deemed to be hazardous. The only difference in the subcommittee, the two different subcommittee reports, is that in one, uh, the subcommittee considered that because a small percentage um, was deemed hazardous that the entire volume of material was deemed hazardous. And in the other subcommittee, they deemed that only that uh, volume associated with the material that we, we didn't know about uh, was hazardous. So in the My Generation case, for instance, the subcommittee found that only the percentage of the volume that was deemed hazardous needed to be offset. And the full commission confirmed that when it approved the project. We are now at the, at the, at the point in this uh, deliberation where the subcommittee has found differently. They found that uh, the entire amount should be offset, it should be deemed hazardous and offset. Uh, now it's in, in front of the full commission uh, for your consideration of the subcommittee's report on that matter. Thank you. Are there other questions? Mr. Short. Yes, I have a question for Mr. Russo. He stated that the benefits are real and that the detriments are speculative. Could he expound on that just a little bit, please? It's actually, um, just so everyone's clear, my, my name is Mr. Peterson. I actually... Oh. I'm part of the LaRusso family, just so we don't, I don't want them to get offended when they hear me up here speaking. Um, what, what, I, what I meant by that comment was that, and I'm afraid I don't have the, um, the detriments. Okay, great. When I spoke about, uh, I'll address the benefits first. Um, when, when I spoke about the benefits, I, I did not um, speak. Ms. Senatori um, explained to you the benefits that were recognized by the subcommittee. Um, in fact, meeting state mandates, creating a tax benefit to the municipality, acting as an economic stimulator, providing a green energy rebate program. These are all clear and definable things. Um, the detriments, uh, yeah, those up, John. <coughs> it was it was our it was our opinion. Thank you. That the detriments were not were not clearly provable, in the sense that the detriments had a probable diminishment of property values. We disagree with that. Uh, probable negative effect on local American tribes and their religious observances. We disagree with that. Um, there was a detriment uh, suggested that the proximity of the project to the nearby elementary school would somehow be of, of detriment. We disagree with that. That this project could possibly detract from tourism. We don't feel it will detract from tourism. So the detriments that are listed we feel are speculative in nature and not um, not clearly provable, and nor have we seen any evidence to the fact that they would be, um, they would be real and substantiable, su substantiated, if that answers your question. Thank you. This time uh, we'll move on. I would invite any federal official present that would like to speak to come to the podium. Any state official present that would like to speak to come to the podium. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, 
uh, members of the commission, uh, Mr. Nizwicki, staff, um, thanks for the opportunity to speak today, um, share these comments, and also um, our serious concerns uh, about the draft decision. Uh, my name is Stephen Clark. <clears throat> I'm the Assistant Secretary for Energy at the Massachusetts Executive Office for Energy and Environmental Affairs. Um, and I also chair the state's Energy Facilities Siting Board, also known as the EFSB. Um, as Assistant Secretary, I focus bo on both developing and implementing energy policy in Massachusetts and, ensure, and ensuring fuel diversity in our energy mix, um, which is a significant priority for the Patrick administration. As Chair of the FSB, I have gained a broad overview of the Commonwealth's energy resource needs, and this project, while non-jurisdictional to the FSB, serves as, serves as an example of how the market responds. Massachusetts is at the end of the energy pipeline, and we are heavily dependent on fossil fuels from other parts of the nation and the world for our energy needs, which leaves us very vulnerable to price and supply volatility. Massachusetts sends upwards of 80% of the $22 billion that we spend annually on energy out of the state. And the ISO New England, the independent system operator for New England, um, the regional grid operator responsible for the, for the reliability of our electricity grid, has also acknowledged on several occasions um, that there's a great need for fuel diversity in the region. Actually, ISO released a report last year that showed that wind energy in New England, in particular, could, make, could actually help us achieve 24% of our energy demand on an annual basis. Renewable energy is one of the few indigenous sources of energy the Commonwealth is rich in, and the Patrick administration has prioritized the development of indigenous local renewable energy in order to spur local economic development and job creation, diversify our fuel mix, and enhance reliability and reduce the negative environmental effects of fossil fuel generation. As I mentioned earlier, I also chair the state's energy facility siting board. The siting board is a nine-member um, review board charged with ensuring a reliable energy supply for the Commonwealth with a minimum impact on the environment at the lowest possible cost. The siting board's primary function is to license the construction of major energy infrastructure in Massachusetts, including large power plants, electric transmission lines, natural gas pipelines, and natural gas storage facilities. The siting board review process is a legal proceeding where the board considers witnesses and evidence in order to determine whether a proposed project should be approved. And local siting concerns, including zoning, are an important issue that the EFSB considers. Prior to the 1997 Restructuring Act, the EFSB also considered need as criteria when deciding whether to approve a particular generation facility. As per the 1997 Restructuring Act, the EFSB no longer considers need because the Act created a free market system where supply and demand would determine the need for new electric, electricity energy generation and not state or local agencies. My colleague Gary Davis will speak about this in greater detail. This project is an example of the market process and operation. A project smaller than the EFSB review threshold, which will contribute to our state's renewable energy requirements and goals while bringing benefits to ratepayers and customers, both in the region and across New England. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today, and I welcome many questions from the Commission. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, one second. There's a lot of people that have walked in since the beginning process, and there may be witnesses from the county or state. Can we uh, ask if anybody needs to be sworn in for testimony at this time? I will. Uh, thank you for the reminder. I may not do it at this point, but uh, we'll do it maybe after the break. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee and uh, members of the general public, my name is Gary Davis. I am the general counsel for the uh, uh, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, and I um, greatly appreciate the opportunity to come down with, here today and share my remarks with you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. Um, I would like to focus my remarks on the, uh, your consideration of uh, need in relation to the, uh, this project. First and foremost, 
We recognize that the Commission has clear authority to oversee the implementation of its regional policy plan for all of the Cape Cod and to re review and regulate developments of regional impact. We also recognize the Commission's ability to regulate the siting of a generation facility based on zoning, environmental concerns, and other impacts as specified in your en enabling legislation. Most importantly, we recognize this Commission's role to determine the impact of development on e existing capital facilities. However, it is equally important to note that no legislative body has unfettered discretion. While recognizing the importance of your legislatively prescri uh, prescribed charge, we believe that the Commonwealth's consideration of need is beyond the list of properly re re reviewable criteria enum enumerated in the legislation. In this particular instance, nowhere in your enabling legislation does it say that the Commission may consider need in approving the siting of energy generation facilities. Most importantly, Section 204 of the Restructuring Act contains a clear and unequivocal legislative pronouncement that the Commonwealth's policy is to allow market forces to determine the need and cost of such facilities. Finally, we believe that the Commonwealth's authority to consider need is also constrained by the specific prov provisions contained within the Restructuring Act <clears throat> in relation to the promotion of the renewable energy portfolio standards. These standards require minimum purchase of renewable energy by both distribution companies and, and so competitive suppliers. The RPS standard is currently set to, uh, is, is currently established at 6% uh, and will increase annually uh, by 1% each year. By 2020, 15% of all electricity generation must derive energy from renewable sources. With an escalating demand established by the legislature, the Commonwealth has made the determination that there was a need for additional renewable energy generation on a statewide basis. Given the clearly pronounced Commonwealth policy that requires market forces to determine the need for such facilities, combined with the legislatively established RPS standards that require minimum purchase of renewable energy, we urge the Commission to consider these legislative mandates when deliberating on your final decision. Uh, once again, I would like to thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to come down and share these remarks with you, and we will entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you. At this time, I would ask um, if there are any local officials that would uh, like to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to run over you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Commission, uh, staff, and, and general public. My name is Nils Bolgen. I am a program director at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. We are a, um, a public agency. Our mission is to accelerate clean energy development in the Commonwealth and create high-quality jobs and long-term economic uh, growth as we do that. Um, I work specifically in the Renewable Energy Generation Division at Mass CEC. Uh, one of the things we do there is offer financial assistance to uh, developers and sponsors of renewable energy generating facilities such as New Generation Wind. And in the spirit of, of full disclosure, we have provided a, an unsecured loan to the uh, New Generation Wind uh, project team to help cover some of their development costs. Um, I wanted to speak uh, this afternoon uh, specifically with regard to the um, ED 4.1, the uh, ec Economic Development and Minimum Performance Standard. You've heard uh, already quite a bit about that here, so I think I can uh, shorten some of the comments. Um, uh, this standard uh, defines demonstrated need and public benefit first as being in response to exi existing regional demand, and second, as improving the availability, reliability, quality, and cost of services. Uh, and as we've heard, the, uh, the Commission sub subcommittee in its draft decision uh, has recommended that the uh, new generation wind project does not uh, meet that standard. Um, uh, I think I can skip 
the uh, re responsiveness to regional energy demand. You just heard Mr. Davis from uh, uh, Energy and Environmental Affairs Office talk about the Massachusetts RPS, which is a feature of Massachusetts state law and clearly establishes uh, a requirement for increasing use of renewable energy uh, on behalf of uh, electricity customers throughout the Commonwealth, including, I, I believe, every uh, retail electric customer in Massachusetts. So um, regardless of whether it's the market or, or uh, this commission that should determine whether this project is in responsive to demand, I believe that demand is there. Um, let's just take a, a quick look at the second aspect of this uh, criterion. Uh, the, the need to improve the availability, reliability, uh, quality, and cost of services. I have a, a slightly different take on this uh, from our experience in looking at the overall uh, electric system. Uh, essentially, uh, no power plant, which is what the new generation wind project is, no power plant provides all of these benefits on their own. Rather, in our integrated uh, regional electric system, each individual component plays a unique an important role in, in, in ensuring that the system operates at optimal availability, reliability, quality, and cost of service. Uh, just a couple of examples. Something that we call baseload plants, these large uh, coal or nuclear facilities, they're relatively cost efficient but inflexible in responding to the daily cycle of demand for electricity. Demand drops off at night, increases in the morning, generally peaks in the late afternoon, especially in the summer uh, with air conditioning loads. These plants just cannot respond to that. We need other features in our system to, re to uh, uh, respond to those conditions. There are other plants, combined cycle natural gas facilities of which uh, numerous have been built ar around the region in the last 10 to 15 years. They are more flexible. They can respond faster. Uh, but they do come at a slightly higher price. That's a trade-off, but it's a trade-off that is made uh, in the name of uh, overall system performance. Uh, and finally, uh, there are some plants that are operated in, in what's called spinning reserve mode. These plants will be run, operated, uh, burning fuel, but not connected to a generator. They're there on standby, ready to be connected, in the case of some other fault in the system, whether it's a transmission line goes down or another power plant trips off. On a, on a cost per kilowatt hour basis, these plants are very, very expensive. But again, they play a unique role in ensuring the, the reliability of our electric system, and that particular cost is, uh, is worth it. Um, so taken in this light, you know, we recognize that while you know, wind plants have variable output and they may not always be the lowest cost uh, sources of electricity. They do provide unique benefits and do contribute in their own way to the overall availability, reliability, environmental quality, uh, and cost of electricity. And just to list some of the benefits, you've heard, heard many of them before. They are free of air emissions. That's one of the benefits. Um, they can reduce electricity costs for the entire market due to the way that um, wind plants uh, participate in the regional electricity markets. I believe the subcommittee heard uh, great detail about that uh, during the proceedings, so we don't need to go into it here. A and also, uh, wind en energy, it moderates our exposure to, to rapid and steep increases in the cost of conventional fuels. Um, electric prices have moderated some in recent years, but you know, the economic recovery is coming slowly, and with it will become resurgent demand for electricity, and inevit inevitably prices will increase. Uh, in that sense, it makes sense uh, to have a fuel-free source of electricity. The technology isn't free, but the fuel is, so it's not coupled to fuel price increases. It makes sense to have this type of electricity in the mix uh, to moderate the impact of any future uh, fossil fuel price spikes. So, um, just to re reiterate, we, we at the Mass Clean Energy Center, you know, we firmly believe you know, there's ample evidence of the um, benefits uh, that the projects such as New Generation Wind uh, provide, and they do satisfy a demonstrated need and provide these benefits. Uh, and with that, I just thank you for your uh, attention and the opportunity. Thank you. Other state officials. 
local officials. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. My name is Christopher Farrell. I'm the chairman of the planning board for the town of Bourne. I'm here on behalf of uh, Ms. Moore, uh, who is not able to attend. And Mr. Garino, uh, our town administrator, was going to speak for her, but uh, previous commitment, he had to leave. Today, uh, Ms. Moore sent to the commission, um, I believe, via email. And Mr. Niswicki's nodding, so they received it. And I'd just like to uh, read this into the record, if I may. It says, uh, dear member, uh, Mr. Graham and members of the Cape Cod Commission, in general findings GF6 through G11 in the DRA decision for new generation wind addresses the project's consistency with local zoning bylaws. GF6 through GF8 adopts and agrees with the testimony of the town planner. However, GF9 maintains that turbine number seven does not meet the local zoning bylaw. As previously stated in my letter to the subcommittee on July 28th, 2011, I found that turbines one, two, five, and seven were consistent with the town's zoning bylaw. The Town of Bourne's definition of a neighborhood wind energy system, number seven, as defined as a class one, two, or three net metering wind turbine with a rated output greater than 10 kW, located in a residential district, serving multiple residential customers, served by a single utility, and as further defined by the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. The Mass DPU defines a neighborhood net metering tower as a class one, two, or three net metering facility that is owned by, serves the energy needs of a group of 10 or more residential customers that reside in a single neighborhood and are served by a single distribution company. May also be owned by or serve the energy needs of other customers who reside in the same neighborhood and are served by the same distribution company as the residential customers that are owned or are served by the facility and is located within the same neighborhood as the customers that own or are served by that facility. The DPU defines a neighborhood as a geographic area within a municipality that is recognized by the residents as including unique communities of interest, falls within a service territory of a single distribution company and within a single ISO NE load zone and may encompass residential commercial or undeveloped properties. Again, in my opinion as town planner, Turbine 7 is consistent with the Town of Bourne zoning bylaw. I have found that under the local regulations that Turbine 7 is a class three net metering wind turbine located in a residential district. Two, will serve multiple residential customers by a single utility. Three, has a rated output of greater than 10 kW. And as further defined, defined by the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities, Turbine 7 is a Class 3 neighborhood net metering facility. It will serve the energy needs of a group or multiple of 10 or more residential customers that reside in a single neighborhood served by a single distribution company. Number three, it is located within the same neighborhood as the customers that own or are served by the facility. In conclusion, I would hope that this letter will serve as an additional testimony to the Commission that new generation wind project is allowable project under the municipal bylaws of the time of its filing with the town. The Planning Board is the special permitting reviewing authority for this project and will determine the project meets the decision criteria for special permits. That's it. I'll take any questions on it. Thank you. Uh, other uh, local officials? Good afternoon, members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Sally Riggs. I am the Executive Director of the Bourne Financial Development Corporation. Uh, to interpret the name of that organization, this is the Economic Development Agency serving the town of Bourne. Um, we have a couple of our board members here with us also today. Uh, what I'd like to do is read a brief statement that was adopted by the Board of Directors of the BFDC um, 
it's brief, but it, I think, summarizes uh, many of the things that have been said here today uh, and certainly clearly states the BFDC's position. Part of the mission of the BFDC is to improve the quality of life for born residents. In that context, BFDC directors welcome opportunities to increase the contribution of the commercial sector to the town's revenues. Directors also support projects that have as a goal the reduction of the region's dependence on fossil fuels. After reviewing the proposed plan by New Generation Wind LLC to construct and operate wind turbines in the Borndale area, the BFDC Board of Directors enthusiastically endorses the project. And if I could add a couple of comments, um, again, as um, involved in, in the Born Financial Development Corporation, uh, I would simply add if Cape Cod is to maintain its preeminence as a vacation destination because of its environment, then Cape Codders need to maintain their vigilance in preserving that environment. Supporting, indeed actively engaging in, our national and state priorities for the reduction of the use of fossil fuels should be part of that maintenance. Therefore, as both the executive director and as a 20 plus year full-time residents of Cape Cod, I urge the Cape Cod commissioners to not adopt the recommendation of the subcommittee and to positively support the new generation wind project. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, uh, we will take a nine-minute break.